good evening all and today we, we have the pleasure of uh, welcoming Steve Chapman for People of Gestalt in OD. Um, I will start by, by introducing you Steve but before I do that, hi Frusina, hi Steve. Hello, nice to be here, thank you for having me. Thanks, thanks for accepting the invitation. So Steve, you, you, you are Steve Chapman, you are also known as Steve So, how do you read it? Everyone pronounces it differently, so <laughs> don't worry. Okay. There's a long story around that involving a car number plate. However anyone pronounces it, it's fine by me. So nice. Uh, you're an artist, a writer, a speaker, and your, your interest lies in creativity and the human condition. You work as a consultant and coach with individuals and organizations uh, who are interested in finding creative ways and counterintuitive ways to help free themselves from stuck loops of common sense for creativity, novelty, and change are rather difficult. You regularly give talks on creativity, spontaneity, human culture, change, imperfection, stuckness, counterculture, shame, and the inner critic, and you're a regular guest on various post podcasts. You also specialize in conceptual art projects designed to provide a counterpoint to what society regards as normal including the Inexpert 2018 conference, which was designed to be the opposite of TED and Sound of Silence, the world's first silent podcast, podcast featuring special guests. You're the founder of the lab, a not-for-profit place to experiment and be experimental on in service of enlivening, enlivening human beings. You also run a number of experimental open workshops and, ev and events, all focused on nurturing human creativity. You have held several visiting roles as a faculty member of a number of MSc program at Ashridge Business School, the Metanoia Institute and Rothy Park, where you have taught spontaneity, working with uncertainty, facilitation and creative activism, both in organization and society in general. You hold an MSc with distinction from Ashridge Masters in Organizational Change program, where you wrote your dissertation on human spontaneity. You have trained in digital psychology, improvisational theater, coaching masks, and art therapy, of which you combined an uh, experimental and experiential approach in your work. You're, you're best when you're on the edge of not quite knowing what you are doing. Um, and uh, on that note, do you want to add anything? Maybe a uh, <laughs> little story with the, the, the plate? It's, uh, it's the most extensive introduction I've ever had. Thank you. Um, but I think that last that that last sentence sums it up. Is I'm at my best when I'm on the edge of not quite knowing what I'm doing, and then that unites mm -hmm. it all. I think it's one of these things with introductions. It's I find them really frustrating because you can never pin yourself down. But then I quite like that. So hopefully everyone is completely confused by that introduction. That would be that would be a good start for me. Well, for me, uh, what appeals the most. Uh when I read that, it's the diverse backgrounds and the diverse things you bring to your practice. And it's quite refreshing. And uh, to be honest, when I first met you as a student at Metanoia, it was quite refreshing to see difference of what I had in mind as a consultant. Um, and I never forget the story where you put people in a story and use it quite oh, yeah. often in organizations yeah. uh, together with Fasina. So how did you meet with Gestalt in the first place? I mean, I've, I think many, many years ago when I initially did some coaching training uh, that brought in some um, ideas from NLP, which I have respect for people that are trained in NLP. I'm not particularly a big fan of NLP personally, but of course, one of the big influences of NLP was Fritz Perls. Um, and that bit of it, I was really interested in. So probably around must be at least 20 years ago um, I've become fascinated by Gestalt and you guys will know and everyone watching will know it's one of the most difficult things to get your head around and I've been in the Gestalt community for like over 20 years now and I still can't eloquently describe it but there was something that really connected with me um, like not just from a psychology perspective but from a philosophical perspective that there is only the present moment you can only have your own experience. So surely that's the only domain we can work in. And it's just obvious to me. 
And from that point on, I considered so many times to train as a gestalt therapist, but lots of gestalt therapist friends put me off doing that. And so I just found any number of ways of exploring the ideas of gestalt and uh, the philosophies of it. So that's how I came across it. And then I end up getting invited into gestalt circles. So the, um, and obviously met my good friend and accomplice Simon Kovicia at, uh, at Ashridge. Uh, we do lots of work together now. But then people like Jenny McEwen uh, brought me in on the master's program where I met, where I met you. Mm. Um, so that, that's sort of been my relationship with it. Thanks. It's a nice background. Yeah. It's a really interesting story, especially uh, what strikes me is your idea to go on gestalt therapy training, but then being pulled off because of the frames, different frames that other schools were offering. And uh, it's nice to be seen that by actually exploring different uh, schools, thoughts, uh, and reflections behind gestalt actually someone can end up working and adoring it and there is a mystery behind it that quite yeah. often at least all of our previous speakers have been talking about the uh, magic side of gestalt and how it actually can be used so it, i guess it runs in the line yeah um, yeah i mean the, what appeals to me underneath i mean at the heart of it all is the arnie bice's paradoxical theory of change because that just i think my entire life that's the way that i've seen the world obviously as a five-year-old kid i've no idea about arnie bice's paradoxical theory of change but it just seems to it just as soon as i came across it it started it just resonated with me and it's it just underpins everything now i think be that artwork consulting work this conversation right now yeah thank you for that input and something uh something that we shared in the informal part before we started recording this video is uh, the uh, love that Angelica and myself have towards one of your books, Can Scorpion Smoke? Uh, so this book covers many theories and techniques of how to be creative in organizations. That is, that's where we have, we have found most of the usage from it. So I'm going to ask you, if, uh, is being creative a step into the unknown that you're talking about? How do you see it? Yeah, I mean, part of the biggest problem that I see with creativity is we've created this really narrow definition of it as a as society. It's like an on off switch. Whereas I think I think of creativity as moving towards not knowing as an exploration of the unknown as the unraveling of the, the present moment. And anyone can do that. If we were to say creativity was writing songs as great as Lennon and McCartney wrote it or being able to paint like Pablo Picasso, then that just cuts off a load of people that don't have the motor skills or the eye to do that. But for me, creativity is that moving towards the unknown, that unravelling of the present moment. And it's, I described it before as it's a process of simultaneously expressing and experiencing difference in the moment so tuning into what is uniquely going on for you in the moment and expressing that and like accepting and working with the the expression of difference from others and that's just a fundamental human process from the moment we've born we've been able to do that um so i don't know why i think we're the only species that has labeled this process as a thing as creativity and i think that just makes it really difficult for us it makes it big business for those that want to sell creativity. Um, but it makes it difficult for the rest of us. And I think Gestalt, what I love about it, the same reasons why I love um, Zen philosophy, is it's quite mischievous, it's quite playful. You work with people like Simon Kovicia or Charlotte Sills, and there, there's, a, there's a wise mischief to the way in which they work. Um, and the same with people that practice Zen. So it's, it's, I find it an incredibly creative body of work. Hmm. And of course, you, you touched something that I've been reflecting quite a bit uh, lately about creativity being a business. And of course, we live in a, a capitalistic world that has been shaken drastically by COVID in, uh, uh, in, in the past period. But uh, I'm interested What's your take on when, when faced with VUCA times, volatile times we're in, 
how how does creativity play a role to 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 stay present and to to play with uh, with, with with situations as volatile and uncertain as COVID. Well, someone asked me on an interview the other week. Do, did I think that because at least in the UK, people have people started baking and painting and doing things and thinking we need to reward artists, uh, theatre directors and actors are all out of work. And they asked me in this interview, did I think that that embracing of the arts would carry on beyond COVID? And my simple answer was no, I don't think it will. <laughs> it's quite a depressing answer because the pull back to that certainty is so strong that the pull to get back to certainty, which was an illusion all along. Because I think a lot of my experience of early on in COVID wasn't that people were freaking out because they'd lost control. It was at some level realizing that control was always an illusion anyway. But the world's always been VUCA. Um, mm. It's just become more inconvenient to the capitalist way that we live our lives. I mean, if you mm. ask the T Rex, is the world volatile, uncertain? They go, yeah, of course it is. So I think it's always been like that. It just becomes more inconvenient for the way that we like to live our lives. Mm. Um, but it can be an invitation. I mean, that's the, that's what the improviser's brain is. Um, that's what I learned from one of the big influences on my work was the theatre director, Keith Johnson, who I worked with for a number of years. And that improviser's brain teaches you to initially short circuit that immediate fight or flight when confronted with the unknown, which is it's a helpful thing if like you're running away from a, a swarm of bees or something. Um, but it helps short circuit that. And then the improviser's brain is what's the offer here? What's the unique thing that this situation I didn't particularly want is offering? Uh, what's the alternative here to the, to the moment that I imagined? And if you can learn to dance with that in that way, then yeah, these times are a, a huge invitation to be creative. I mean, this year, most of my um, workshops and speaking work has completely gone for, for obvious reasons. But what's come from that is I've, I've lived off of making and selling art this year, which I've loved. In fact, I've loved it more. The next work face to face workshop that comes in, I think I'm going to be going, oh, I don't really want to leave the house. But I think it can mm. if we. If we can short circuit that immediate default to the unknown and uncertainty, um, we can dance with it in a way that is really creative. I don't know if that answers it. That's that's where the thought takes yeah. me. Uh, it does answer it, and you, you you gave me food for thought on how it's all about creative adaptation of us, what we do with the situation, how we choose to to live it. We can yeah. choose to be afraid of it, or we can choose to create something else of it. And if you look at that from a Gestalt perspective, so if you think of the cycle of experience, choice is as a result of awareness. Hmm. And I did a talk on this the other day saying, um, is with an organization that wanted to do some stuff on dealing with uncertainty. And I started off by just making the distinction between peripheral and foveal awareness. So we know what peripheral vision is, but there's also a peripheral, I talk about it as peripheral awareness. So that's peripheral sight, peripheral sound, peripheral touch, peripheral instincts. And then foveal is when we're focused. And biologically, in a moment of, of panic or adrenaline, we go into a foveal awareness. So we shut down. We just, we just see the saber-toothed tiger that's attacking us. And that means that we have a narrow awareness of the present moment and then a narrower range of choice. And I think we're designed that way. I'm not a biologist, so this might be completely wrong. I think we're designed in that way to help us get out of dangerous situations. But if it's not immediately life-threatening, that ability to expand your peripheral awareness means you become aware of the sight, sounds and smells, the subtle whispers in your, in your psyche and the, the body, the body suddenly arrives back and you've got feelings and flow and heat and movement and discomfort. And then you've got so much to work with. You've got like an entire palette you can work with. But I think that's what that, that's where the gestalt theory would underpin that is that moment of pausing, of grounding in the body, of really tuning your awareness in the moment. And I think you can, you can train yourself to do that. Hmm. I, I completely agree with you on what you just said. And it brought me back to 
uh, sentence that you shared that uh, control is actually illusionary in moments. And that it's even though we think that we have control, it's something that's difficult to be achieved. But by grounding and actually tuning in these uh, different responses of the body, sensations that we pick up, it actually some it, they can benefit us in a way to help us not just cope and confront whatever is scaring us in the moment, but also adapt and creatively, essentially, because it creatively adapt on the changes into the uh, world and our surrounding that we cannot avoid, to be honest. Yeah, 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 that's exactly it. And again, it's having a sense of control is really important. It stops mm. me freaking out and wondering what it's all about. But at the same time, I want to hold on to that it is uh, illusory. I could think, right, I'm choosing to pick up this pen. Mm. But if you really uh, get into the philosophy of that, um, every action is spontaneous. So I can say, well, no, I chose to pick up that pen. But at what point did I choose to choose to pick up that pen? Mm. And if I say, well, I chose to choose when you said that, I can keep going back to, so when did I choose to choose to choose to pick up the pen? And then you just start to think, actually, yeah, everything is weirdly spontaneous um, in a way that we can't quite understand. And I, I just like to shuffle between those two things. I'm always suspicious when I find something too concrete, which is why I've, I have a love-hate relationship with theory. Alfred North Whitehead called it the fallacy of misplaced concreteness that, that human beings do. We make the world more concrete because it makes us feel more secure. Mm. But it also inhibits change. It, it, it makes us, it creates stuckness. Definitely. Whenever we're operating by either or, we're stuck, we are not playing out with all the possibilities that are existing uh, in front of us. Yeah. And I'm just going to follow on, on what you were discussing until this point. And I'm aware of a, an image in your background, Sound of Silence. This oh, is been, that, yeah. 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 <laughs> this is a sign that I believe a lot of uh, those who are going to watch this video are going to find it familiar, especially um, having it uh, seen on LinkedIn at least, if not on other uh, channels. This is one of your podcasts, uh, which has been playing with the unknown. But from my stance, it was also experimenting with presence. And I'm curious of whether you can tell us a bit more about this whole project, how it started and what's the yeah. story behind. Yeah, so that's the, that's the actual original artwork that all of my guests held. So the hundred guests have held that. So I've got it framed and safe because it's, yeah. Uh, that project started the same as all of my projects, which is I'll notice a pattern and um, I'll be curious about it and think what would happen if I broke that pattern. And it came about just with the absolute saturation of podcasts nowadays. So I'm not anti-podcast, but I just noticed that there were so many podcasts, that like everyone had a podcast. Um, irrelevant of whether they had anything to say or not and there are good podcasts and there are podcasts that i'm not interested in but it made me think it made me think and i went out for a run and there's something about running that just frees my thinking i often say that my inner critic isn't very fit so he can't keep up with me when i'm running and kill my ideas but i went for a run and i started thinking I think I'd seen there was some other leadership hacks podcast, like here's the top 10 things that the leaders don't want you to know. And I just thought, oh, I wonder what the opposite of a podcast would be. And then that's the chain of thought. I mean, this is one of the gifts of dyslexia is this, this monkey mind that goes off in tangents. So I thought, I wonder what the opposite of a podcast would be. Well, it would be a not podcast. So it would have no content. It would just broadcast nothing. And I thought, well, that would be interesting. And people would download nothing, but it's a digital nothing. And I thought that would be great because we're, we're quite distracted digitally as a society nowadays, at least in, in the Western world. And so what if people downloaded a pause? And then I thought, well, what if I actually had special guests as well? That would make it even weirder that I had a special guest that I recorded silence with. And then it, the chain of thought went off from there and I got home and I registered the domain soundofsilence.org.uk and Sound of Silence was always going to be a working title it was never going to be the final title because I didn't particularly like it uh, but it ended up being the actual thing and then one of my mantras in my work is to leap then look because with strange ideas like that everything in my sensible adult self is saying this is stupid don't do that 
So I have to act before I can talk myself out of that. So I registered the domain and announced to the world, July this year, I'm starting the world's first silent podcast with special guests. And it went from there. And over the period of the next two and a half years, I recorded a hundred episodes. So right at the start, it's another counterintuitive thing. I like to, to design impermanence into my projects. So it's not just going to go on forever. I said, it'll only be a hundred episodes. Um, so a hundred weeks, so two and a half years. And the other constraints that I put in, because again, I think it constraints are really important in creative work where it always had to be recorded face to face and no episode would be longer than three minutes and it's centered around two minutes of silence and then it went from there it was i look back on it the last episode came out i don't know when was it it's on my wall august this year and i look back on it and it's like a dream i think did i really do that because i i end i traveled the intention was to do it around the world but for various reasons that didn't happen um, even though i went to germany to record with someone only to find they weren't there so i even didn't get to record in germany but it's, it's an indescribable project. It's weird, people download it. And just like you've said, it's because there's no content, it, it's a pattern interrupt. And there, there's an intro and an outro um, just, to, just to sort of hold it. But because there's no content in the middle, it means that people can pour into it whatever they need in that moment. And many people have said to me, oh, it's about presence. It's about peace, it's about silence, it's about anxiety, or it's about creativity. And my answer is, yeah, it can be about gardening, it can be about whatever you want, because the structure, the void it creates, allows you to project into it whatever you want. And that's, that's how the project came about. And I like, in, in all, of, all of my work, I like to have just enough structure so I don't have to be in charge of the project. So I don't want to manage the project because it would be boring. I like to have a minimal amount of structure so the project leads me wherever it wants to go. Because it's always going to take me to better, more exciting places than if I'd come up with it. And I met some of my heroes, uh, people like the comedian Eddie Izzard. I mean, <laughs> most people know who he is. I, um, humanitarian Terry Waite, I spent the day at his house. Episode 50 I recorded with my dog because it's a silent podcast you could record it with a bat if you wanted it doesn't really matter so that's that's what that project was and i regard that as much of an as an, much of a gestalt od intervention as doing some work in an organization intentional counterintuitive disturbances and invitations to deepen our awareness yeah well th thanks for that uh, um I'm still processing. It's true. It's a, bl a blank canvas. You can paint whatever you want uh, when looking uh, and hearing the silence. Um, and I'm thinking of the perceived weirdness index yeah. and how it's important to introduce um, uncommon and um, not usual things in organizations to disturb patterns. Um, I'm, I'm, you, you mentioned your inner critic, uh, just when you were answering the, 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 the previous question Frasina asked, um, you've done a TED talk on dancing with your inner critic. Um, how, how does it affect in your view, the dealing with the unknown in, in organizations, inner critics of people? Um, if I talk, if I start talking about it personally, uh, it's and what we what I mean by the inner critic is the super ego that that part of us that ultimately is trying to keep us safe, but over years has become deluded and just talks us out of doing anything vaguely different. And I don't, I won't go into people can watch the talk if they want, but in the talk, I'm just saying about the process that I tried to do, which was rather than do battle with it or flee it to learn to dance with it. So my, my philosophy was, well, if the inner critic hates me doing weird creative stuff, why don't I just do everything it hates? And so it's all, my inner critic become a bit of a, a bit of a muse for me in doing that, but it's still there. It's still an ever present thing 
for me and for other people I talk to about it. Mainly associated with fitting in, um, either fitting in with an idealized version of ourselves, um, like this is what a 47 year old man in the UK should look and sound like in a type of job, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, fitting in with other people's idealized versions of ourselves and then societal versions of ourselves. So I, I don't think it can not exist. Um, and it's, I, I'm not saying you're asking a strange question. Society asks strange questions of do these things exist in organizations or not, which I find baffling because it's we're the same species inside and outside. It's just we wear different clothes and the buildings look less exciting. It's, so it, it will be present. And it, for it to come out in a group, I think is very rare. So I've only ever come across people talking about it in an organizational setting, maybe in one-to-one -one work or small work. And most people volunteer the fact that they have this, this voice or this narrative um, in a sort of slightly shameful way, as if they're some sort of broken human being. But as I said mm -hmm. in the talk, it's, I think it's highly functional to be aware of, but not slave to, to be aware of this, this part of ourselves. And one of the mm -hmm. things that Simon uh, Kovicia and I talk about on our, on our workshop is try and get people to tune into the fact that the moment you become aware of judgment or comparison, that's, that's the domain of the inner critic. So the moment you become aware of judgment or comparison of yourself or of others, be that good or bad, it's a real subtle evaluation that's to do with some idealized sense of self or other. And, and I guess the question is, is it helpful or unhelpful? Um, does it affect anything or does it hinder things would be, would be the question to, to find out. But I think anywhere there's humans, there'll be, there'll be inner critics at some level. Mm. Like the message that either manifests as shame or narcissism it can it can go maybe one of two ways uh, I, I don't know why it merged to me uh, in this moment but uh, somehow cultural differences also emerged to me and how the inner critic is quite uh, present for for some cultures who have been colonized or um are part of uh, minorities, either ethnic or religious, and um, that affects on how we deal with the unknown and the creativity in organizations as well. Yeah, and I, I can get away with doing strange work, A, because there's a level of comfort I have with the unknown, but there's a massive platform of being a white Western middle-aged man associated with academia means I can get away with it without others making me smaller. And, and I still experience it with all of those platforms to build it on. So I think it, it must, it's hugely inhibiting. I spent um, years with my good friend, Claire Breeze, facilitating dialogue, uh, like Bohemian dialogue around the world uh, on the subject of difference, difference, belonging identity it was a diversity and inclusion program but because we came at it from a dialogic perspective it was much deeper than that and we did this work around the world uh, we went to india we went to singapore and europe and the us and the uk and that exactly what you've said came up in a number of the dialogue sessions was what people would describe as the double whammy or the triple whammy so not only did this assume everyone in the room had an inner critic and there would be loads of other things going on as well. They would describe that as being a young Indian woman in a predominantly Western organization. There were so many more levels of this to get through to even reach the same level of paranoia as everyone else. So yeah, I, it, it sort of, yeah, there'll, there'll be societal loops of it as well, but uh, by, by no means worked with millions of people, but, the little gallery that I created of inner critics, which has got about a thousand pictures in it, were from people from around the world of different ages. And everyone seemed to be able to express it artfully, to be able to express it in a way. So I hadn't come across anyone 
that had said, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. Now, of course, that's biased because if someone really was in denial with their inner critic, they probably wouldn't talk to me or admit it. But I think it is a universal thing. But yeah, exactly as you say, society and patterns, and that will make it much more difficult for others. Hmm. It's interesting to say that uh, from around the world, everybody was able to represent it creatively. Creatively, it seems that creativity is a language spoken by all of us, uh, no yeah. matter where we stand in the globe. Well, and it's again, if we look at it from a Gestalt perspective, words and cognition isn't the isn't the entirety of our awareness. But you'd think if, if I came down from another planet, I'd think it was because it's the thing we reward. It's the thing that we um, we promote. But there's an entire magical world beyond words. I did a talk the other week where I said, as an adult, we're taught that if we run out of words, we're deficient. Or if we can't explain something, we're deficient. And whereas I think when the words run out, the magic begins. We have to find another way of experiencing ourselves in the world which is where the mm. world of art therapy is okay. You know, I did, there's a pattern here. I did lots of art therapy training, but didn't want to become an art therapist. I was just interested in the foundations of it, but to be able to express what's going on for you in the moment through clay, or I've got some friends um, that run an organization called move beyond words, which works with dance and particularly dyslexic artists mm. as a way of, exploring meaning and awareness in a non-verbal way the the trap is that again we've we seem to have learned that creativity or making has to be for something or about something now you someone may make some sort of movement or some sort of sculpturing clay and the very act of doing that kinesthetically gives them an insight but they don't have words for it. That doesn't mean that that insight hasn't happened, but quite often it's like, oh, I can't explain it, so I must write it off. Uh, but it's a, it's a tactile, non-verbal, kinesthetic, way, a, a wonderful way of deepening our awareness, as long as we can get over the fact for it doesn't have to be about anything and we don't need to hand our mm -hmm. homework in. It's just for us. It's just for nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we had a. She's not released yet, but a, a, another colleague, Jan Chuptrin, who spoke about uh, movement in as a gestalt intervention in organizations. Um, so I totally agree with you. Uh, it shouldn't be about cr creating something for showing it, but just the act of creating is is powerful by itself. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I I I make in order to see what I've made when I finished the process of making. Even, mm. even with art, it, the same with Sound of Silence. I didn't know what it was going to be until it was done. I knew vaguely it was going to be like these episodes around, 100 episodes around this. But that richness that came out of doing it, I didn't know until it was done. And mm. it's, we're not like that as children. And there's a danger of like, um idolizing children here as well say so, oh children are so creative just be like a child we it is, it's not as straightforward as that but i think children haven't learned this this thing of only do stuff if it's going to result in only do it for a reason hmm. but if we see if we look at the world entirely in terms of output growth profit then it loses all the magic the rest of the natural world don't do that my dog doesn't run and jump in the lake thinking, right, this is going to really improve my swimming. Um, it's just, she's just doing it because it's, it's instinctive. Mm, I was silent because you made me think quite a bit, especially when I look, at, look back and remind myself of how the video of Dancing with My Inner Critic is and how much at least it brought for me especially when it comes to exploring this Achilles syndrome and becoming aware of this, the voice inside of myself that sometimes blocks me. I do agree um, that the exploration should 
at least for myself, it was more of the process of not knowing until it became a figure that I can play with. And as kids, we do have this freedom to make mistakes, to draw on the walls and to do whatever we want without thinking on the outcome. And as we join corporations or as we become part of the adult world, this is where a lot of constraints appear when it comes to we need to perform, we need to deliver, there are rules that are saying, saying that we need to move in a particular way. And if we're moving differently, this can sometimes be perceived as odd and weird and yeah. even not a cultural fit for some organizations, which is where actually organizations lose a lot of the creative power that people can, can bring into the whole process. Yeah. Well, I think fear fear keeps a lot of things the same, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. And you you mentioned splitting earlier on, and immediately if I talk about stuff like this, I know you guys aren't doing it. People go, "Oh, you're saying fear is good." It's I'm saying I'm not saying fear is good or bad. It can be helpful and unhelpful, but it it inherently moves towards maintaining the status quo. But the thing is, I always say culture change, which is what most of us in this field are interested in. Culture change should look, feel and smell countercultural. So there's going to be an element of Ooh, about it. If not, it's more of the same. So to be perpetually fearful of the weird, of the unusual, of the strange is fine as long as you don't want transformational change. There's a, there's a French philosopher called Luce Irigray who says, what's her quote? The, the, I think it was the problem with try, constantly trying to make the strange familiar is that we avoid the problem of meeting the stranger and all they could have taught us. And it's that thing is, how can we meet the stranger in a, in a way that we, we're prepared to learn to learn from them? And I think for for me, I want to try and do that right up front, right from if I'm working in an organization, it's easy with things like sound of silence, because it's my own risk. But in an organization that there was one that I in the process of possibly possibly not working with at the moment, that wanted so they said they wanted something different, they want something unusual around culture. Um, and I read the brief, and it seemed very similar. It's like, this doesn't seem any different to me. It, it sounds like you're asking for one thing, but secretly you want more of the same. So my response, my RFP was 25 post-it notes that I just wrote, I did some doodles on and wrote some things and put it in an envelope and put it in the post. Not as a gimmick and not from a position of arrogance, but it's just, if you really mean what I think you've said in here, then this will intrigue you and baffle you and probably annoy you at the same time. But let's see what happens next. And if they respond, then it's a different type of conversation to if I'd given them exactly what they wanted. The big downside to that is you don't win as much work. In fact, considerably less, but the work you do is then really rich. So yeah, don't, <laughs> I'm not the best person to advise on building a profitable business. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm laughing because I can relate on that. And, um, and some weird stuff and being seen as weird in some organizations. But I've, I never thought of, of uh, putting an answer on post-it notes to, to just trigger something. Yeah. So. Well, and it was, uh, and I might not do that again, because again, the trouble mm-hmm. is that we might think, oh yes, that's the way to do it. But in that moment, when I read that brief, I had some post notes, I had a pen, and it seemed like it's imperfect and it's there's spelling mistakes on it. The last post-it note, I drew a little picture of me and it said, sorry for the mistakes, I'm dyslexic. Um, but in a different moment, it may be something different. It could be mm. that a very, the counterpoint to something that's wildly all over the place is something very sterile. Mm. And that's what I'm interested in is counterpoints and pattern interruptions. I'm a big fan of, we might have covered it at Metanoia, I can't remember, we used to at Ashridge. Um, the work of Paul Vatslavik, the patterns of stuckness, um, which my simple understanding is there's a book by Vatslavik, Weakland and Fish that's got a grand title of something like Change, Problem, Formation and Resolution. Um, it, <laughs> it's such a hard read. Um, don't read it unless you're really up for a bit of endurance. But the content of it is brilliant if you can get through it. Because pretty much what he says, and he's talking about a clinical setting, is most of the things that we do to transform end up 
make, reinforcing the status quo. And there are either things like to try harder from the same mindset, to oversimplify the situation, to find these utopian silver bullet solutions, or to create paradox that paralyzes us. And I think initially I always, and I will do the same, and I spent 20 years in a big corporate and I would have done exactly the same. When you're that close to the patterning, you can't see it. So it's really difficult to interrupt. So that's what I'm always interested in. It's always a, a compassionate assumption that what they're asking for at some level is going to result in more of what they don't want. And that's my, my going in point. And I don't know either. I don't have a formula. I don't have an answer. And again, that's where I end up losing a lot of work. So I want to get in and co-inquire. We're on an adventure together. We're side by side. We're working mm. out as we go along. I have experience and expertise and so do you. And again, that's mm. it, grounding it back in Gestalt. That's how a Gestalt therapist would work. That's how I work as a Gestalt coach. It's not like I'm sitting here going, hmm, yes, right. I'm in this moment of relating with you here and now noticing all my excitement my anxieties my tensing stomach my bafflement co-creating together yeah and it's it's again it's um it's easier to do as an internal consultant it's really difficult to do as an external because it's another frustration is i only ever get to go into the formal bits that are arranged for me to go in whereas all the real rich juicy like flow day-to-day so -day stuff happens when i'm not there and so I end up just saying, look, don't worry about paying for me, but can I just hang out? Can I just hang around? But even then you get the observer effect. It's, mm. uh, yeah, that's what makes it, that's what makes it fun, I think. So, uh, can we be a bit more greedy and ask you for another story of yeah. an unknown story of you as a consultant artist? All oh, right. Um, well, again, you mentioned it at the start. So one of my favorite projects was the InExpert project. And I can talk about an organizational one as well if you want. But these ones, I, I've started to think that we've got it the wrong way around. The types of interventions we have in society like protest and graffiti and all of those things would really have a bigger effect in organizations. And the types of things we do in organizations really should be societal interventions because those people then go and work in organizations. Mm -hmm. So in expert was, I still regard it as a Gestalt OD intervention, although most people would say, no, of course it's not, you didn't get paid for it. Um, but again, I was thinking as a result of doing my TED talk, people started taking me more seriously. And it's like, why? Why is that? It's just me saying a load of stuff, like I'm saying to you now. The fact that it's on a red spot and now that's given it so much more weight that doesn't feel healthy that feels it feels weird and again i'm not anti-ted but i started to think right there's this pattern here of this over-reliance and expertise of wanting these quick fix life hack solutions and i really wanted that ted talk that i did to not have any tangible takeaways and at one point i say look i've not <laughs> i'm still in this it's not been solved so i, I thought well what would the opposite of ted be and it, same as the sound of silence, it came from there. And I thought, well, it would be speakers giving talks from a position of not knowing. It would be a celebration of not knowing. And there's one of the mantras in improvisation is if you're going to die, die big. So if there's something's not going to work, make it not work spectacularly. So I hired a London theatre, that 100 seat London theatre, and said to the world, I'm doing this thing called an expert put out a call for speakers, which was really interesting because most people clearly didn't understand what I was after. But in the end, recruited 16 really good speakers, experienced people, but they gave talks on subjects that they had no expertise in. They were interested in, but had no expertise in. And that was the sweet spot that I wanted to get. If you think, I wanted it to be like, if you think of a six-year-old kid doing show and tell at school, Maybe they're interested in dinosaurs and they know three facts about dinosaurs, but they present to the class as if they're the world's greatest paleontologist. They know everything about them. And I thought, well, what would happen if adults did that? And uh, in addition to like this huge theater that, that are filled up and the speakers, we had an art exhibition that someone curated um, in the foyer. And the art exhibition had art that had gone wrong. 
um, that the students of City Lit donated. And my friend Nick Parker did all the music because he'd been learning to play the trumpet for six weeks. And six, six weeks is that sweet spot between you know how to get a note out of it, but you, it's hit and miss what note it's going to be. And then that was the experiment. That was the container. And it is an indescribable afternoon. It was, I think it was May the 11th, 2018. And because it was doing this counterpoint, I discovered what it was about as we did it. And what mm. I realized was there was, because there was no tangible takeaway and no expertise, there could be no failure nor success. Neither the speakers could get it wrong or the audience couldn't miss the point because there wasn't a point. And then there was no status difference between speaker and audience. And in fact, the theater, it was, um, it was accidental. I didn't design it this way. The audience were higher than the speakers. So it's normally traditionally the other way around. But there's no status differential, which meant that the speakers, uh, the audience felt as awkward as the speakers at times. And lots of people wrote articles about it, but most people just said it was an indescribable afternoon of being human together. Or to quote Kershaw Denegara's book, it, it's an afternoon of being flawed but willing together. And it was amazing. Then everyone said, when's the next one? But the, I think congruence is so important in our work and what made it work for me was I did not know what I was doing. I've never run anything like this before. And so throughout the whole thing, I'm thinking I've, I've no idea what I'm doing. I'm terrified and excited by this at the same time. And I said to everyone, I can't do it again because I'll know what I'm doing. So it can never happen again, mm -hmm. which I, I like it. The fact that that really frustrates people. It's like, come on, do another one, make it bigger and better. And it's no, I want to make it smaller and worse. I don't want to, we can't do it again. And that, the ripples of that, some I know, um, like some I know that how that's really affected and disturbed and helped people, but many won't know. And that's the wonderful thing about this work, isn't it? You put something out there, you don't know, you don't know what's going to happen. But I think that and Sound of Silence mm. have been the biggest, scariest projects that I've started, really. It makes like, organisational change and culture change works. It, it has a different feel to it. Oh, for what it is work, I do think it's an uh, organizational development in, in, in OD intervention in the way that I strongly believe that we should be using our skills and our uh, experimenting to, to make a better society and yeah. bring people together rather than apart. And it's the, it's the same process. It's not even a process. It's the same philosophy or way of... It's not even a way of thinking because it's spontaneous and intuitive. That I'll, when I'm at my best, is how I'll be in organisational work. Um, <clears throat> even with doing talks, I'm at my best without a script. Because if I got, if you I always say to speakers when I'm doing speaker coaching, if you don't have a script, you can't forget your words. Yeah, <laughs> it's as simple as that. But I, it reminded me of a. I spent three years doing a big piece of creativity work for a. Um, retailer global retailer and <clears throat> i prefer to try and get in to get the work started at least not through the formal channels so i understand the need for procurement and for gatekeepers and all of that which is i totally get that but most of that process rounds everything off to the point that it's impotent so it's not going to make any difference and the bits of work that are most exciting for me is when there's someone there's like a an activist or someone in the organization that has the organization's best interests at heart, but can get some air cover or permission to do some different work. And then that was what happened in this organization. I spent a year doing probably about 20, 25 workshops with everyone at the coal face of this organization. So in the warehouses, in the shops, and we had some action learning going along with it, and then some experiments. So we'd do some experiments in different ways of being and interacting. And we brought in suppliers and we brought in customers. And then after about a year, the board heard about this and said, right, what's going on over there? This looks really confusing and interesting. And they'd heard some stories. And they, uh, my contact in the organization said, can you come and do a presentation to the board about what's happened? And I thought, well, I think that's going to be playing into this stuck pattern here. So I said, why don't you say to the board, let's have half a day together 
and you can come and play with us. And we'll get all people that have been doing this work and you can come and play with us. And uh, it, they, uh, they made it happen. But then two weeks beforehand, I got an email saying it's gone down from a half a day down to three hours. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you, you're both smiling because you'll be familiar with this. And it's like, okay. And I think it was two days before or three days before I got another email saying it's gone down to two hours and they need to take a lunch break in the middle of it. And I don't, I'm probably not allowed to swear on this, but I did at the time. So, oh. This is, this is um, as Ralph Stacey said, this is a defense against anxiety here. Now you could argue that there were other priorities, but it just means that this isn't a priority. And then this is where the improviser brain comes in. It's thinking, right, what's the offer here? Instead of either getting really grumpy and saying, well, I'm not going to do it, or really watering something down, what's the offer here? And I thought, well, the problem is lunch. They need to eat. Uh, they're human beings they need to eat in this short time slot that we've got so i wrote to my client and said um this is what i'm going to do just to let you know and i wrote to all of the board and the ceo and i said for our session a couple of days time it's going to be a bring your own buffet and i'd like you to bring some food to share with your friends it could be some of your favorite dish something you've made at home whatever you want but bring some food to share with your friends I deliberately used that language of friends, food, buffet, all of that. And my client was terrified, saying, you can't ask them to do that. You can't ask them to do that. And I said, look, if this all goes wrong, then they can fire me. And the response to me doing that was incredible. Uh, I got loads of emails from people saying, oh, it's been nice working with you. Yep, see you later. I got emails from the CEO's PA that said, does, let's call him Bob, does Bob have to do this? And it said, well, yeah, if Bob wants to eat, then yeah, bring some food. The implied code there being Bob is in charge. Bob doesn't normally mm-hmm. do this. And then on the day, it was fascinating. So I was in the room and again, I'm thinking, I've, I have no idea what's going to happen here. This is terrifying. Why is it so terrifying to ask human beings to bring lunch for a chat together? Then a load of PAs came in with trays of food and put them down. Uh, a couple of people came in that had taken a risk. This uh, lady from the Caribbean had made some plantains and bought in some plantains. Someone else had made uh, like sandwiches and things like that. Someone else made these little pizzas. A couple of people came in looking a bit embarrassed and they just bought like a pack of sandwiches and things. Then the CEO walked in and he said, I didn't know anything about this. I would have made something last night. And he'd been protected mm-hmm. from it all. And then in the end, all we did in those hour and a half or whatever we had, um, was eat lunch and talk about the experience of them being asked to bring lunch. And they couldn't believe how terrifying they were. They couldn't believe that our people were terrified that I'd asked them to bring lunch to eat food together. And some of them hated it. Some of them said it was ridiculous. We don't know, we're busy people. But it surfaced and brought into awareness in an undeniable way, everything that was getting in the way of this project that we was doing on the ground. And it was a completely accidental, improvised, intervention that could have gone any way and i think that's a similar example of what what's the offer here what can we work with here what can we use here and again the ripples that set off some positive ripples uh, they really realized how scary they were and tried to be less scary um, the project went on for another couple of years but then other people completely resisted it and didn't really want to work with me anymore but yeah, I think that's a that's a good example of working live and in the moment, but in a way that has the organisation's best interests at heart. It's not yeah. arrogant disruption or anarchy. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a great example, Steve. Thanks. You've uh, you you've enlivened something in me. <laughs> good mischief, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. yeah, quite a bit of it actually. Well, yeah, and. It, Gregory Bateson said, change is news of difference. Mm. And it's, it's such a, it's easy to go, oh yeah, I get that. But if you sit with, sit and think about that and contemplate that and experience that, he's absolutely right. Is, is that manifestation of difference and difference to me equals weird, equals strange, equals unfamiliar. Mm. And that's, that's so important. If we're interested in anything changing and shifting. Mm. I've come to think that art, and artful practice the, the the purpose of art is to create moments of doubt where we question the reality we've made concrete and for me 
if it does that it's art if it's not maybe it isn't i don't know and art, artful ways of knowing artful ways of being like chris seeley did a lot of work in this area at ashridge um and not just thinking of an artist in residence as someone that does sketch notes of a meeting the, the playful mischievous part of all of us it has a real role in organizations thank you steve um i think we're at the end we're hitting the one hour mark and mm. uh, it's been a real pleasure uh talking to you this evening no thank you for having me and it's uh it's always fascinating to get an opportunity to talk about this stuff because it's normally just me in these four walls talking to myself about it or my supervisor or my therapist so thank you thank you for being our guest thank you a lovely christmas steve yeah you too <laughs>